My name is Dr. Sabrina Smiley. I'm one of the 2022 program co-chairs, and we are so excited to host this evening's event. The topic tonight is tobacco regulatory science, health equity, mental health, and public engagement. And it's a live podcast by Dr. created by Dr. Ni nee Addy. And we have an expert panel, Dr. Pebbles Fagan, Mitch Zeller, and Kathleen Crosby. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Addy and let him have it. Dr. Nee Addy is the Alfred E. Kent Professor of Psychiatry and Associate Professor of Cellular and Molecular Physiology. He received his BS in Biology from Duke University and his PhD in Neuroscience from Yale University. Dr. Addy directs a federally funded research program investigating cholinergic, dopaminergic, and L-type calcium channel mechanisms, mediating substance use and mood disorders. Dr. Addy's team also studies the ability of tobacco product flavor additives to alter nicotine use behavior and addiction. He serves on the journal editorial board of neuropsychopharmacology, biological psychiatry, nicotine and tobacco research, and neuropharmacology, and is a grant reviewer for the Neurobiology of Motivated Behavior, study section of the National Institutes of Health Center for Scientific Review. Dr. Addy currently serves as the inaugural director of scientist diversity and inclusion at the Yale School of Medicine, as the director of the faculty mentoring program for the Yale Minority Organization for Retention and Expansion, also known as MORE, and as co-chair of the career development subcommittee of the anti-racism task force in the Yale Department of Psychiatry. He also contributes to graduate student and postdoctoral training and to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives through his efforts on campus and in scientific societies. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Addy. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's always humbling to hear. And every time I hear it, I always have to emphasize all the teams that are actually in place to help us do this work. So I know that's been a theme of the conference for all those of you who are here in the room. Uh, but I'm really grateful to be able to have this opportunity to have our first in-person recording of the Addy Hour podcast. Um, there's definitely a different level of energy that just comes from being in the room. I'm sure our listeners who will be listening across platforms will be able to sense that as well. So in the spirit of where we are in time, I just want to open up and kind of set the tone to say, as others have said, you know, this is a time where we're definitely celebrating a lot of things, being able to move and engage in ways that we haven't done for quite a while as a society, um, being able to celebrate a lot of the work that's being done around tobacco regulatory science, as we'll talk about today. But at the same time, we know there's still a lot that has to be done. Um, and so I think it's entirely appropriate and possible for us to hold both of those things together as we continue to move forward um, as a society. Um, and I think what we'll be talking about today also reflects what's going on in society as lar at large. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges going on in the world today, even as we think about everything that's happening in Ukraine and elsewhere. I also did want to acknowledge that this is March 16th, 2022, when we're recording. And so this is the one year anniversary of the tragic events that happened in Atlanta a year ago, when several lives were tragically lost from our Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander community. So I want to make sure that we at least acknowledge that and continue to give space for that and not forget about those things because even though that was one isolated incident, there are other things that continue to happen to members of that community. We wanna make sure that we continue to elevate those conversations and to move things forward to action. And of course, that action is something I think that can give us hope as we continue to try and move forward as a society, even with all the other things that we've been moving forward some of those things which you'll hear about today as well. So with that framing and that uh, approach in a sense, I'm uh, really grateful and honored to be able to be here and to host this conversation with all of our esteemed guests and want to go ahead and introduce them to you now. Um, so as was mentioned already, the topic for today's discussion will be tobacco regulatory science, health equity, mental health, and public engagement. And so I'm honored to be able to host individuals who have been at the forefront of those types of efforts over the years um, and excited to also have them interact with each other um, and to, to uh, see how we can even elevate that conversation and continue to move things forward. So I think what I will do is actually just introduce in the order that we have of everyone sitting here on the stage. 
So the first guest with, uh, which I would like to introduce, which is someone who's familiar to those of you who are here in person, is Mitch Zeller, who is the director of the Center for Tega Tobacco Products. And in that role, he leads FDA's efforts to reduce disease and death from tobacco use and bring previously unavailable information about its dangers to light. Mitch has been in this role at the FDA since March of 2013. And in that role, he has been implementing uh, the mission of the Center for Tobacco Products to make tobacco related death and disease part of America's past and not America's future. And by doing so, to ensure a healthier life for every American family. Mitch is someone who has been at the forefront and working at FDA related issues for more than 30 years. He actually began his career as a public interest attorney in 1982 at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. In 1993, he actually joined the FDA under then commissioner, Dr. David Kessler. And what was supposed to be a two work assignment actually turned into a much longer uh, foray with the country, so, or with, the, with the FDA, so to speak, where he, be ser where he was serving as an associate commissioner and director of the FDA's first office of tobacco programs. He actually left the FDA in 2000 to continue to work in this space with the American Legacy Foundation, also had a stint as senior vice president of Piney Associates, and then again returned to FDA in 2013. Um, and as many of you know, we'll be retiring soon. So this has been in some ways a celebration of his efforts, and I'm honored and grateful to be able to welcome Mitch Zeller. And seated next to Mitch is Dr. Pebbles Fagan, who has lots of different titles. I'm only going to highlight a few of them <laughs> here just for the sake of time. Dr. Fagan is a professor and the director of the Center for the Study of Tobacco in the Faye W. Boozman College of Public Health. She's also the director of research in the Office of Health Initiatives and Disparities Research at the College, uh, Medicine, College of Medicine at the University of Arkansas. And she's someone who has been engaged in this work for over 25 years conducting research that seeks to understand factors associated with tobacco use and exposure in racial and ethnic women, low socioeconomic status, and youth young adult populations. And she also seeks to develop community interventions that aim to reduce tobacco and cancer-related disparities. Dr. Fagan has a number of leadership roles and initiatives. One I'll mention is the newly funded Center for Research, Health, and Social Justice. She also is a senior advisor to the CDC and also has put a lot of time and investment to training students and faculty members to advance their research careers as well. Again, several different accolades, one I will mention, so those of you in the room have heard this, those listening, I also want to make sure that you know that she just received the Presidential Award from the Society for Research on Nicotine Tobacco for her career contributions to tobacco and disparities research. So honored to welcome Dr. Pebbles Fagan to the Addy Hour. And last but definitely not least, also would like to introduce Kathleen Crosby, who is currently the director of the Office of Health Communication and Education mm -hmm. at the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. So in that role, she leads an office that is responsible for conducting public education, stakeholder outreach, and regulatory communication programs designed to ensure FDA success in implementing the Tobacco Control Act. These efforts include developing breakthrough communication strategies to reduce youth tobacco use, helping current tobacco users quit, and building stakeholder understanding of compliance and FDA product regulations. She's been involved in multiple public education campaigns, including The Real Cost. And she also has a long-standing career with over 20 years of experience as a senior in senior level marketing and advertising and working on several large-scale multimedia campaigns. Also um, served at the Ad Council for quite a while and was a campaign, campaign director for 17 United States government agencies someone who's been very invested in this realm for quite some time. I'm glad to be able to work on her, her here to the podcast as well. Well, enough of me speaking. We obviously have folks who have lots of accolades and are experts in their, their spheres of influence. But for those who may be regular listeners, you know that I always like to start out just checking in and seeing how everyone's doing at this moment in time. So I'm going to go in reverse order now and actually start with Kathy first, just to see how you're doing at this point in time as we continue to re-engage in society, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you, that's a great question. I think, um, I mean, obviously these last several years have been really difficult, um, difficult as individuals, as a mom, as a wife, um, certainly as a colleague, as a coworker, um, but I feel a sense of hope that we're coming out of it. And um, I know that more still has to be done. And we, you know, sometimes I 
even though my role is to really pay attention to the news, sometimes I can't look at the news because, you know, there seems to be a big bump coming in uh, COVID in Europe. And so, but, you know, my, my, my mindset is that it's, it's going to be okay and we're coming out of it. And, um, you know, I'm excited to collaborate again in, in a, in a shared space. This feels so good. Mm. I've missed that greatly. I've missed the, the, the collegialness and the, um, collaboration and the creativity that sparked when people come together. So I'm especially thankful that we're here today. Yes, definitely agree with you on that and Absolutely. all the aspects you've highlighted about the hope that we still have in the midst of everything. Thanks so much for sharing, honestly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fagan, what about you? Yeah, I'm excited about being here after uh, being at the meeting in New Orleans <laughs> and the few of us who were there and then coming back here to Baltimore is just amazing. Um, you know, these last two years have been a whirlwind, mm. I think for many of us. And, uh, but I think, you know, we can talk about all of the uh, uh, negative things that COVID has brought into our lives, but I, you know, there's some opportunities that it's brought for us as well. Opportunities for new discoveries, opportunities for how we relate to each other and how we treat each other and opportunities for change. Mm. And so those are the things that I've been focusing on um, throughout the pandemic and looking for new ways to live life, how we do our research and how we tackle um, tobacco prevention and control. Mm. Thanks so much for sharing that. And not to jump too far ahead, but I, I love the way you highlight that because I get the sense that all of you have been doing that in your efforts over the years and are continuing to do that even in this phase that we've been in over the last couple of years and moving forward. Just using those opportunities to really move things forward as, as is needed. Mitch, what about you? Um, it has been great to, to be with a bunch of human beings in person. <laughs> um, I said it when I took the podium uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, it, 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 there's going to be some uh, emerging definition of what the new normal is mm -hmm. for all of us personally and professionally. We don't know what that is yet. I think we all personally and professionally need to expect the unexpected, whether it's the next surge coming from the other side of the pond or uh, other, other global issues. And for me, just on the professional side, uh, it's been an, an extraordinary test of the, 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 the people of the Center for Tobacco Products at FDA. And I am grateful for um, the level of effort during unprecedented times. It has come at a price though for, for all of us, not just those of us in federal service. I mean, the, the challenge of work-life balance, especially if your family situation involves childcare or elder care or, or, or any other um, health-related issues, um, has, we've paid a price, but it's been very gratifying to see the commitment and the dedication of the, the people that I work with as we all kind of mud, have muddled through this from our home offices or wherever we're working from uh, at home to, to get the job done. And I know that that goes for everybody involved in uh, tobacco control. And, and, and th that, that to me is what so, um, was the emotional reaction I had to be, to be here yesterday. Mm. Because uh, we all have day jobs in different realms, different sectors. We're all working towards the same overarching public health goal when it comes to tobacco use and to be back together with the, uh, the wonderful family of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco meant a lot to me uh, personally and professionally. Mm. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing that. Really well said. And already, I know we're only a few minutes in, but so many themes that are, that are cutting across all the comments that you all have made. Um, one thing that really strikes me about the work that you do is it's so focused on people and on society. But then again, at some level, it seems that the level of humanity has actually been increased over the last couple of years, as you're even talking about being attentive to the different challenges that people have been walking through. Um, Pebbles, as you're talking about looking for new opportunities, and, and Kathy, as you're talking about hope. So I wondered if you all would just actually comment on that a little bit in the sense that how has that humanity been elevated in ways that it wasn't there before? Because again, it's something you all were focused on before, but I get a sense that there's a different level at which that has has come across recently. So anyone who wants to, to jump on I'll, I'll start. I think that um, with 
the systemic issues related to um, social justice and inequities that have always been there, but coincidentally emerged during the last couple of years at a societal level. I, I sense all of these, these things coming together because those kinds of systemic issues have a direct connection to reducing the death and disease from tobacco use. Because when we look at, especially when we're talking about the most harmful products, any name, name your combustible product, who is the remaining smoker? Who have we left behind at a population level with all the progress that has been made in the last half century in reducing consumption and prevalence? And there's a direct connection between all of the profound issues re re relating to inequality in this country and the health issue that we work on. So I've seen more of an intersection mm -hmm. between all of that, unfortunately, because of tragedies that have taken place in some of our cities over the last couple of years. But, but from that, just to look at it through the public health lens, is an opportunity. Because um, the issue of health equity and health disparity, in, in our field at least, has never been more top of mind and more prominent because of what's going on in society, at least in my experience in tobacco control, than I've seen in the last two years. And while there's huge underlying systemic problems that go beyond reducing the death and disease from tobacco use, I can tell you in this administration, in the federal government, um, the, the issue of health equity and health disparity is an enormous priority. And from that, comes this huge public health opp opportunity for all of us mm -hmm. when we think about who the remaining smoker is. Yeah, and then when you think about humanity, I mean, of course, COVID has forced us, and not just COVID, but all of the uh, social injustices that have happened over the last um, several years have forced us to think about, you know, what does it mean to have a humane society? And, uh, mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, used the uh, social ecological model for many, many years to understand the multiple influences on human behaviors and human development, and uh, but have done very little on how we intervene on those factors beyond the individual level. And so um, it has certainly forced me to think more about that. I've always thought about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can remember when I was at the National Cancer Institute and I asked the question, why don't we do interventions that intervene on social factors? I was told, well, NIH doesn't do that, right? And, uh, but why don't we when the fact is that, you know, the people who are left behind in terms of smoking are people who are poor, um, people who may have low literacy, people who are isol geographically isolated in rural communities, people who uh, may live in segregated neighborhoods, who may be racialized. And so when you think about those things where tobacco use is still clustered and people are left behind, you have to begin to think about the social circumstances and the structural factors and how do we shift and change those things. And we started it integrating those things into a randomized trial that I was doing because um, our smokers in our study were hungry. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were suffering from food insecurity mm -hmm. and we had to address that issue. You know, we could not just sit there and try to uh, do motivational counseling and help people to keep their homes smoke free and quit when they were suffering from food insecurity issues. And so we had to begin to address that, partnering with the food bank and getting food out to the communities. That's what we had to do. Yeah, really well said and re really important. Before, Kathy, before we jump to you, uh, Dr. Fagan, I also just wanted to, and you started to allude to this already, as someone who's been doing this work for so long, I mean, as much as you're willing to share, how has this increased attention? How, how have you responded to that in a sense? Have you, I would imagine in some ways it can be empowering, but I also imagine that that's a mixed reaction, because I know I've had some of those reactions myself, but how has that actually, one, how have you responded to that, and how has that actually impacted your work as well, as much as you want to share? Well, uh, thanks for asking that question. Um, when we had to start doing food distributions in the community, we decided we would write another grant 
and test out whether or not increasing food security has an impact on smoking cessation. That grant got funded. And that's part of our uh, Center for uh, Research, Health, and Social Justice. And so mm -hmm. we are asking the question, if you intervene on social factors that we know are associated with smoking, but people, people who are more food insecure are more likely to smoke and less likely to quit, there are mm -hmm. studies out there that show that. So if you can intervene on those factors, does it change circumstances for them? Can we get people out of the addiction cycle? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also um, forced me to work in the COVID arena as well. Um, I wasn't running, jumping, trying to become involved in reducing disparities as it um, is associated with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But the communities in which I was working were experiencing disparities um, in terms of cases in terms of deaths and in terms of low vaccine rates i mean we some of our counties still have vaccine rates that are in 35 percent mm. you know yeah. and 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 so we have a long way to go compared to vermont and new york mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really important yeah. and just you know i also just want to acknowledge again that flexibility and the fact that you adjusted to meet people where they were, even though it wasn't your original research question. Yeah. Also knowing that that takes more work too. So I yes. imagine there's a fine balance there <laughs> as well. And something I'm sure we'll come back to in the yes. conversation. Yes. But Kathy, I also wanted to give you a chance to respond well, to that. Well, starting with your original question, um, you know, I have two, I guess, personal examples of how um, kind of bringing to life what, what you were just saying. But first of all, I need to say that Mitch is a great boss because he, over the course of the pandemic, um, he allowed me to do a lot of time off from work, um, volunteering, obviously I, I took leave, but volunteering because you mentioned food insecurity. Um, during the pandemic for over a year, our church was asked to help to reach into the community to deal specifically with food insecurity. And once we started getting out into the community, I mean, it was, you know, it was in the midst of the shutdowns and, you know, there, there were no vaccines and we really didn't understand where COVID was going to go. But the community need was so great and the fear in people's faces were so great that once we started doing it, we had more and more and more requests. And so basically we would go out into the community um, every day of the week and deliver big boxes of food. And, and I would always go on Friday mornings and I would see the same people over and over again. And so many of them deal with so many of the factors that you were talking about. Um, but what I would like to say is it, it, it gave me a belief that you know we can band together in times of intense trial and we can help others. Um, and so I, I felt encouraged by that as sad as it was to see. Mm -hmm. And the other example I would give, it was the federal response to all the children that were coming in across the border, our Southern border um, without families. And so there was a massive federal outreach to go into these cities and help to bring these children in because once they're once they step foot in the u.s they're the health and human services must take care for them and so um there was a massive volunteer unit again mitch allowed me to to leave my position for six weeks to go and um it, seeing these children coming across um it was unbelievable it, it was sad but it was also amazing to see how the American people, the, the host cities kind of stepped up to bringing these children across. And, and in both cases, they, they were COVID hot zones, right? It's like working in the community, tons of COVID, um, and then bringing these kids in and working in the community to try to help them find families here. Um, but yet it, it gave me a lot of hope that we are a society that can care about each other. And um, so not necessarily related to tobacco control, but it's certainly... I mean, you know, many of these kids came across addicted. You mm -hmm. know, many of these kids had never had, um, you know, even really doctor's appointments. And so it was amazing the care that we gave them. And it it, it, it really um, encouraged me about the good that we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really well said. And I love the way that you all have highlighted just aspects, again, of touching on humanity in different ways, some within the work, but some, again, having that time mm -hmm. to be able to step out of your official role and to really be able to meet people um, where they are. Um, and the mission sounds like we've done that a lot of ways, even within the CTP organization. So again, just, you know, themes that you all have uh, continued to implement in so many important ways. I'm also curious how these stories have 
impacted your motivation going forward? I mean, Mitch, you touched on that with the, the new normal or what that, whatever that might look like. But how is this actually impacting how you approach things on a day-to-day -day basis now in your current efforts? I, I think just you know, sort of programmatically, um, it, it sort of comes back to some of the notions I already touched on. Um, because we're working in an administration um, that has, in my entire uh, career in tobacco control going back um, almost 30 years, um, I've never seen this kind of focus on health equity and health disparities. Um, I think, and this goes way beyond product regulation, this is um, an unprecedented opportunity for comprehensive tobacco control efforts at all levels, federal, state, and local. Um, and um, it, it's, so it's not directly related to life in, 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 a, in a pandemic. It is directly related to everything that we are trying to deal with and struggling as a society when it comes to um, those who are more well-off and less well-off and understanding why. Why, why are um, entire groups of people in this country left behind? Um, in our day jobs working on tobacco, we know all of the statistics, they're, they're, they're profound. And, and for me, those population level, when we say historically low levels of, of adult and youth smoking, that's great. But who is the remaining smoker? And however you slice and dice it, educational attainment, household income, is there a, what's the smoking status in the household, um, racial and ethnic groups, um, sexual orientation, however you slice it, there are profound disparities when it comes to tobacco use. And so the opportunity here is finally, at the highest levels, attention is being paid. And the, for me, the fundamental question is being asked, why? E even though I think everybody in the room um, can answer that, it's th that deceptively simple question is being asked in a very, very serious way. On, as far as I'm concerned, inside the federal government at the highest levels for the first time. And whether it's tobacco use or food insecurity or uh, any other um, social or public health issue that we face, I'll share Kathy's optimism that the, 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 the sunshine that's being focused on these issues is giving us opportunities that we have not had before. The, the problems have always been there but this is an unprecedented opportunity because of the attention that they're getting. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Really well said. Yeah. Go ahead. I yeah. think one, one thing though, um, and not to take the sad side of it, but um, something that's become so clear to me, especially in our work with youth, um, is you know, the, the emerging issues with mental health mm -hmm. and you know, our area, what, what, what we work most closely with is obviously trying to prevent youth from using tobacco products, but you know, we haven't always been successful. I mean, there's been a lot of, um, you know, countervailing reasons why I think a lot of kids were especially started vaping. And now that they're addicted, um, they reach out to us often and, you know, with, with really incredible stories about how they never used to be anxious, they never used to be afraid. Now they feel depressed all the time. Now they want to, they, they self isolate themselves. And it, it, it really appears that, you know, on top of the of the pandemic, we are seeing many many mental health issues emerge, and you know our piece is just one of it. And um, you know I always quote this because it was so telling. Because one one team we were talking to in the early days um, and talking about the addiction, and you know he's like, you know, all I did was just add crap to the crap. Mm -hmm. And and I think that there is, especially if you're addicted, um, you know, at, as you most you know, when you're withdrawing from that nicotine and you need another hit, it's very anxiety producing. But it, with, when you add that on top of everything that was happening with COVID, the, the fact that everybody was self-isolated mm -hmm. in their homes, they couldn't go out. I think that we have a lot more mental health issues that are emerging um, that are leading to all sorts of terrible things. Um, other type of co coping mechanisms with different types of drugs, suicide rates seem incredibly high. So I think, you know, to me, it's it's made me realize that there's just so much more that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, mental health has become a real big emerging issues that we're developing messaging on now. Yeah, 
Yeah, really important. And I'm glad to hear that message is being developed, but also seems like the conversation is being elevated in ways that it wasn't before. Yes. Um, and especially even as the data is coming out with all the stressors that have been added um, with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Figgin, I also wonder if you would respond to that, just based on the communities that you've worked in where obviously stressors can lead to a lot of these different components, both from the mental health side and youth, uh, from youth side and how you've continued to try and approach that, even though there's a lot of work. Yeah, I, I think um, the COVID-19 and other things that are happening in the world are forcing us to think about workforce issues, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, how do we uh, retain a viable workforce in all sectors? How do we uh, continue to build the scientific workforce, the practitioner workforce, and the advocacy workforce? Those are real issues. And, um, uh, and also uh, create uh, new work climates mm. for people to live, breathe, and work in that are more humane um, and still get at productivity. And so uh, my experience during COVID-19 is, you know, I went home, and I took my desktop home, and it was great. And I created more work for myself because, not just because of COVID-19, but you didn't have to run to meetings. I didn't have to travel to work. Um, I saved on that time so I could stop at lunchtime, go walk, come back and still be productive. Now transitioning back into the workforce and you've created an extra four hours of work, but now you still have your four hour getting ready for work, coming home added on. How do we make those adjustments? Mm -hmm. And people like Mitch are retiring. That's, <laughs> that's, that's his adjustment. That's a stressor. That's a stressor. Look, we said we we're going to try to make people laugh a little. There it is. So that was a joke. <laughs> but um, those are real issues. And it's a real mental health issue as well. And trying to make those adjustments when there's such a great need. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to ha strike a life balance. Because I'm getting away from saying, work-life balance. It's life balance. Mm. That's what it is. If you lead with the work part, we get it wrong, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's life balance. And how do we make that happen? And we haven't had enough conversations about our transitioning back to um, whatever that normal looks like, because it's not what it was yesterday. Um, people kept saying, well, get back to normal. I don't know what that means mm. right now. <laughs> But we need to have strategic discussions about what that looks like. Mm. And I think we haven't done enough of that. Uh, we have to reframe what a research field looks like now. Mm -hmm. What does an academic workplace look like? What does a federal workplace look like that is healthy, yeah. mentally healthy, viable and productive and not contributing to premature deaths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's been really interesting to see um, just inside of our agency, and, and, I can, and I can say this goes beyond our center because as a center director, I, I hear from leadership throughout FDA, and FDA is 18,000 people, um, that uh, the adaptation to 100% remote or 100% telework, once we got through some technical problems, literally just during the first week, was pretty smooth. Um, and to, uh, to Pebble's point, people got used to it and actually um, became more productive to the point where that raised issues of um, uh, actually work being piled on because they didn't have to do the commuting and they didn't, and didn't have all the other things that come with that. And so where FDA as an organization finds itself now is um, asking some really profound questions about its physical footprint going forward. Mm -hmm. Do, does, an, does an agency like FDA need all of those buildings? Um, or in whatever the new normal is, is it going to be you know, so different that, that rethinking the, the need for physical workspace or how much of it um, is something that is starting to be discussed? And it will be very, very interesting to see. And assuming those conversations are happening in, in other small, medium, and large size organizations, um, I don't think we can predict what the future is going to look like other than it's going to be very, very different from what it, it looked like for us when it comes to workplace issues that Pebbles was talking about when it all settles down. I think it's going to be really different. And I think 
uh, I hope, a, a much better balance between uh, work responsibilities, making it easier on um, the people who are doing the work while balancing familial responsibilities as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important that you both highlighted that there is a danger to try to go back to what was normal before in the sense that we don't want to lose everything that we've learned over the last couple of years, things that have been ignored before that now have more attention. And so that in itself, I think, is even attention uh, for some because there can be this tendency to try and want to return to what was normal with all of the caveats that come with that as well. Um, so maybe more so for, for Kathy and Dr. Figgin, I'm curious from your standpoints, just in the work that you do and in the communication space, how you think it is important for us to continue to move things forward so this doesn't become passing in a sense. Because there is, I do often sense that pull for people to tr just wanting to go back to what felt familiar, even though there were a lot of problematic aspects with what was familiar. Yeah. Um, so how, how does that come up, I guess, in a day-to-day -day basis for each of you? Well, I think especially for um, the office that I oversee, I, I think people have learned to love um, the, the ability to work exclusively from home. And so if anything, I think, um, you know, what I'm hopeful about is the opportunity to explore what a hybrid workspace might look like. Mm. And, you know, maybe that means that for really important times of collaboration, people are able to come together. But, you know, I think that we've learned that people can be, can do their job and do it really well um, and not be in a physical environment where you're all together. So for me, I think the challenge is going to be finding that right mix because right now everybody has, I guess what I would call somewhat of a taste of freedom, right? So, um, and, and we really haven't missed a beat, as Mitch said multiple times, in terms of productivity and being able to do our jobs. It's like, you know, we, we, um, our bread and butter is talking to the audiences that we're trying to develop messaging for. And in the early days, we had to really like figure out how we're going to do that. But now we've figured it out, right? It's like, it's all done online and we really haven't had an interruption in our ability to actually, um, deeply have a good conversation with a youth or an adult. And so we don't need to go back to traveling to 28 cities for 48 focus groups, right? Like we know we can do it online. And so I think we've learned to adapt and I think we're super productive. And I think people love the opportunity to only dress from here up and not worry about what's down below and, you know, walk into the kitchen and make lunch or walk and have a nice um, afternoon walk. And, and so I think, for me, it's trying to find the right balance where there's the opportunity, because I, I also worry about, especially those who are younger, who really would benefit from the opportunity to listen in meetings, see how things happen, see how like creative brainstormings go. And I, and I do worry that some of the younger generation, if, they, if they're not able to be in person when lightning strikes, um, if I do think something is lost over Zoom. And so... My, my worries are how do you keep an engaged workforce such that they still feel like they have balance in their life, but that you can continue to grow and thrive um, in somewhat of a shared space, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going juggling. Yeah. Go ahead, I mean, I would love to see more strategic discussions about what the new workplace looks like. Mm. Um, I have talked with my team. Um, they're all here at the meeting with me. Um, and um, uh, for their for career development to give them a break as well, come to Baltimore, you know, see what I what we do here. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had discussions about, you know, how do we move to a four day work week? Um, now that's a tough thing to figure out. Mm -hmm. Places like Finland and other countries have it figured out, and the research is fairly solid on the fact that you know those countries that have moved to that particular model, mm -hmm. that the people are as productive or more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to think very carefully about that. You know, the U.S. is very slow to adopt some of these models that work in other places. And these countries, other countries are doing just fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing just fine. Um, so we have to reevaluate our value system around life itself. Um, and I don't think reevaluating it means that we're giving up something in terms of making progress mm -hmm. because the reevaluation may help us get closer to progress faster mm -hmm. and expeditiously, right? As compared to the way that we're, we have been doing things. So when I said, you know, we have to look at 
these tragedies as opportunities sometimes, you know, because if you, you know, the tragedy is the tragedy. And if you let it um, take you down with mental health issues, you'll, 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 you know, destroy yourself. So you have to start looking at things as opportunities. And what can we do strategically around the nation to begin to plan? And I think the people in this room are um, primed to do that around changing work climate, you know, eliminating things such as microaggression, eliminating things such as biases, eliminating things such as structural racism in the academic system, the federal government, um, doing things like making sure that women who are concentrated in particular jobs are paid fair wages and making sure that women who do community-based work who are out there busting their butts mm -hmm pay the same wages of the person who's working in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to think differently about how we're going to move forward. But it takes willingness to engage in strategic discussions around that in the same way that private industry has done and say, hey, what are we going to do differently? Let's look at the workplace. Let's look at the goals that we're trying to accomplish in tobacco prevention and control. How do we get there and how do we shape the workplace to get to that goal without um, killing ourselves and without contributing to the premature morbidity and mortality mm -hmm. um, by killing the workforce off? Yeah. So, I mean, those are real issues. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, there's so many great things to, to unpack there. To Kathy's point from before, though, I mean, just uh, in a humorous way, the uh, only dressing from the top of you all will notice that we decided and made a pact that we were going to do the full dress today. So no one came in pajama bottoms, even though I'm sure that was a, a temptation, just how things have been going in the past. Yeah. Uh, but Dr. Fagan, so many, so many key things which you talked about. One, I mean, not to complicate it, but yes, to complicate it in a sense too, as you've mentioned in other settings, those who are doing health disparities research who are often spread thin in the first place. And so that was and has been the norm. Now you add on this layer of also trying to adjust and make sure that there is balance in, in the workday and workforce. How do you, and you've started to talk about it, but how do you put those together? I mean, I guess the strategic piece is part of that, but there may not be an, an easy answer, but I just wanted to at least kind of highlight that because I know it's something Oh my goodness, Shadi and I just had this conversation about two hours ago. Um, sometimes, it, you know, I think it's helpful for us to, vocalize some honest things, which is sometimes you just have to check out, mm. right? And take a break. <laughs> and if that means you may not respond to an email ever, it doesn't mean that you don't want to respond to it, but sometimes you got to save yourself, mm. right? Sometimes it means, uh, and I'll give this example, two Fridays ago, um, uh, my um, my team had a tough day and um, I wanted to take them out um, so that we could, you know, we were supposed to do a luncheon for um, uh, celebrating employee day. And and I said, oh, to this afternoon, let's go out. They were like, nope, no way. <laughs> we need a we need a break today. Mm. And uh, you have to honor that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to check out. Sometimes you have to schedule breaks you have to do it for yourself mm -hmm. and for the people who are working on your projects sometimes you have to allow that sometimes you have to facilitate that as well sometimes you have to say today you know everybody leave you know we're done today sometimes they tell me we're done today <laughs> <laughs> and and when they say that i'm i'm okay with that mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, even as a, a manager of people, mm -hmm. you have to be attentive to folks' needs. Sometimes you're trying to save yourself, but you also have to make sure that you're helping them as well in this complicated environment. But doing health disparities research, I mean, you know, those of us who have been doing it for, you know, decades um, um, have, um, I, I say, bear the burden of doing the research and people who are new to it um, uh, may not hang in there as long because you really have to be resilient. Mm. 
there's a, a high level, not a low level, very high level of resiliency that you have to have in order to survive it because the need is so great. Just like I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been working in tobacco disparities. I also do cancer disparities with colorectal cancer and then COVID got added on. And so it's a lot, it's a lot, um, but there's a great need out mm. there. And, um, but what brings joy um, to that is to see that you are making a difference, that you're changing someone's life. And I don't mean looking at the survey data. I'm talking about looking at people's faces and talking to them on the phone and my team coming back to me saying, hey, such and such really um, appreciated what we did. That makes the difference and that keeps you going every day. Yeah, really important and grounding in a lot of ways as well, yeah. despite the all the effort and resilience that has to be there to, to maintain. So in a lot of ways, I think, again, just giving honor where honor is due for someone like you has been so deeply engaged in this work for so long and knowing that's making that impact is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. So I know it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Mitch, to, uh, to pivot back to you as well on that note, as someone who is shifting into uh, retirement, just Again, curious to hear a little bit about what motivated you to get into the work in the first place um, and what your, I guess, your greatest um, point of achievement and, and gratification has been, you know, with this, this long and impactful career. Well, my, um, other than knowing that I wanted to be a lawyer and did not want to work for a law firm and did not want to work for a corporation, I just wanted to do public interest law, the, my career has been completely serendipitous. Um, and it, it all started with the first job that I had out of law school that, uh, that you mentioned working for the Center for Science and the Public Interest. But honestly, if my first job out of law school had been working for a civil rights organization or an environmental group or a, a, a prisoner rights group, I think my career path would have been completely different. But that first job was working on food labeling, food safety and nutrition for six years. And I did litigation, I did lobbying, I did a lot of media work um, and a lot of interactions with FDA. And it's this summer would have been 40 years of my working on FDA re related issues, but it was really happenstance. Um, once I was kind of put on that path and realized the work that the Food and Drug Administration does, whether I'm there um, trying to, to, to advance policy or on the outside trying to influence policy, um, was something that I was very interested in. The tobacco work for me started in 1994 uh, because the commissioner at the time, David Kessler, said, um, we need to investigate the tobacco industry. We need to truly understand what they know about the role of nicotine in the design and manufacture of cigarettes and smokeless tobacco products. E-cigarettes didn't exist then. And smokeless tobacco was the poster child for harm reduction back in uh, the 1990s. Um, and it just all happened um, after that. Um, and it was Dr. Kessler who gave me the opportunity to work on tobacco. And as you all know, if you're here, um, you start working on this, whatever your day job is, and uh, there's kind of a different notion of addiction to the issues. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm retiring, but the last 28 years of, of my FDA-related career it's been a labor of love with all of the challenges and with all the ups and downs. Um, it's been an absolute labor of love and I couldn't have planned it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it really was um, a serendipitous from that, that, that very first uh, job right after I graduated law school. I know a lot of people are thankful for that serendipity, for the <laughs> effort that you've put in over the years. So yeah. I appreciate you. you sharing that as well. As we're getting close to our time, I did want to pivot to some of the public engagement a bit as well. Um, obviously, you know, Kathy, that's your official mm -hmm. job, but in a lot of ways, a, a lot of all of you are involved in public engagement in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. But Kathy, just to uh, pivot to you again, just to talk a little bit about that within this realm of the disparities, because I know that's been a big point of emphasis and intentional. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how that came about and what you've tried to do within that space, even as you're trying to reach broad audiences at the same time? Sure. So um, no matter what the issue is, and, and you mentioned my, my time at the Ag Council, um, we oversaw almost 30 different pieces of business for federal agencies. 
And, um, but what was the tie that, that bound all of them together was that, you know, we were trying to help people understand whatever the issue was so that they could potentially lead healthier, safer, um, you know, more empowered lives. And so, you know, for me, whatever the issue is, you have to understand which audiences are, um, would most benefit from whatever the issue is or which audiences are most, um, you know, disproportionately hurt by whatever the issue is. And then, you know, my, my suggestion is that we don't, you don't treat the audience as they're homogeneous. You really have to understand, like in the case of, of youth, who were the youth that were smoking cigarettes? And when you really peel back the layer of the onion through comprehensive research, you understand that a picture emerges of those who are most at risk. And then you have to understand why. What made um, American Indian, Alaska Native uh, teens so at risk? What makes African American youth so at risk for this product? And 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 if you treat them as individuals, not as a mass population, and you peel back the layer of the onion to understand what their current knowledge is, what their attitudes, what their beliefs are, what their barriers are that are you know making them do the behavior or conversely making them stop the behavior, you can begin to develop messaging that will be relevant and persuasive, but based on the uniqueness of that individual. And so to me, um, it's about what the issue is, who is most hurt by the issue, what can you learn about them, what do you, how far do you need to nudge them to really help them? Um, and, and that's how we approach all of our advertising efforts. Yeah, that's really encouraging here, just that attitude of really listening and meeting people where they're at in the in the programs that you're putting together and it seems like it's been very effective from the statistics i've heard you share over the years as well mm -hmm. um dr fagan and mitch i wonder if you'd comment on what how you've also i mean dr Fagan, i'm also just thinking about all the different things that you do and the different layers of your communication in different communities and how you've navigated that over the years as well yeah, I want to talk about uh, state legislatures, you know, because uh, when I came out of the federal government and started working in academia, I had to uh, figure out how to communicate issues around tobacco to state legislators mm. in Hawaii and then do it in Arkansas, which are two very different states and how you communicate that information. You know, while in Hawaii, the big issue that we were dealing with at the time was uh, e-cigarettes took off there um, early mm. compared to other states um, because their cigarette smoking rates were down because the taxes were so high. Um, but e-cigarettes shot up. And so we were, our research team there um, started working on e-cigarettes early on. And we had some of the first papers to come out um, we were looking at the association between e-cigarettes and quitting behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, Paolo Pokrell was the lead author on that paper back in 2013. But we had to learn how to communicate issues to state legislators who were unfamiliar with products, who were unfamiliar with issues around flavors, who weren't necessarily familiar with issues related to menthol, you know, um, as a flavor. And so, um, I had to become skilled at that. And then I went to Arkansas where um, you have a different group of state legislators who are very uh, pro-tobacco. Um, mm -hmm. Hawaii was anti-tobacco, but there's still a skill set that you had to develop to communicate things to them. And so it's a work in progress, mm -hmm. learning how to influence policies at the state level, educating people about the things that need to be done to protect youth from e-cigarettes to uh, help people to get um, help with quitting uh, tobacco products to make sure that um, dis disparate communities have access to nicotine replacement therapy. When they call the quit line, they can access those things. And so I think we still have a long ways to go in terms of sharing stories uh, across states mm. on how you uh, communicate things to state legislator to make sure that we are improving public health and not harming public health. Mm -hmm. Really well said. I, I think I think for me, and in listening to what Kathy and Pebbles were saying, the the thing that resonated with me as I think about the the job that I've had for the last nine years, but ha having learned from each previous position and the the people that I've had the the privilege of working for throughout my career, 
It really comes down to, and it sounds simple, but it's actually really hard. Understand your audience. That's what I was hearing from Kathy and, mm. and Pebbles. And when you think you you understand your audience, think again, mm -hmm. um, because if you if you think again, you may come up with something else that you hadn't thought of before. Mm. And in, in my job, whether it's inside of government and having to um, engage with um, uh, members of Congress, staff, um, whoever the incumbent administration is at the department level or at the White House. Um, or, or whether it's with any of the stakeholders um, that, that we have a responsibility to engage with, or media advocacy. Um, understand where your audience is coming from, what's on their mind, um, whether it's something that you see as things they don't understand that they need to better understand, or if they're a decision maker, something that you're trying to persuade them to, to um, agree to, but understanding where they're coming from and what might be holding them back. Um, and I, we spend a lot of our time trying to understand our, our various audiences and the more effort we put in to that in, in any setting and any encounter. It doesn't, doesn't dramatically raise the likelihood of success, but it makes for a much more productive mm -hmm. um, interaction and it, and e even when we deal with tobacco companies, it, there's a need for a dialogue and there's a need for you know, a, a degree of mutual understanding, even if at the end of the day, there's way more that you might disagree with mm -hmm. than agree with, but just the responsibility to understand your audience. Yeah, and again, that really ties back into that level of humanity uh, as well, as you all have been highlighting in your comments, maybe not necessarily with that word, but I just that sense has been coming out as well. I think that's really, really important. Well, as we get ready to close, I would just also like to give you all an opportunity to, you know, kind of have a final message to our in-person listeners and to those who are listening uh, on all the uh, audio platforms. What, so both in terms of what gives you encouragement, which you all have talked about and hope moving forward and just uh, any words of uh, guidance that you'd like to share just with the general audience as well around these aspects that we've highlighted today. So. Well, and on a, it's a light, a light yeah. question, <laughs> not necessarily, but Kathy, you look like sure. you're ready. So I, I think um, one thing I would love to, to share is that, you know, nicotine is obviously an incredibly addictive drug, but what I have seen is tremendous success um, in both preventing youth from using the product by finding ways in that are meaningful to them to help them to, to make a different decision before they ever try a tobacco product. And despite the fact that how addictive it is, it, I'm very encouraged that um, we know that kids, once they are addicted, are very, very open to getting help. And you know, at the federal level, the, the most I can do with the advertising that we develop is help them to convince them to take an opportunity to quit. But there are so many amazing services that if, if I can open the door to that and then hand them over to, for instance, NCI, which, which really helps in, in a collaborative way to give them the tools and the te techniques that they need to quit. So I guess my, my, my overall point is, is that if you are in a communications and messaging field, um, if you find the right insight to the right audience and you have the right creative wrapper, you really can break through um, and, and help them live healthier lives. Really well said, thanks so much. Dr. Fagan? Yeah, there, there are two, two things I want to leave the audience with, which is uh, uh, I'm very excited about um, our uh, developing new bold leadership in the field. Um, and not just in tobacco prevention and control, but public health and all of the sciences, because it, you know, if we're looking at it from a multi-transdisciplinary approach, we need each other in order to um, really reduce the toll of tobacco use in this country. And so, um, you know, I'm asking that um, the next generation of people um, get engaged in leadership opportunities uh, to grow, to develop, and take bold steps, take risk. Um, you have nothing to lose, uh, I can assure you of that. Um, and when you think you have something to lose, talk to a, a senior person about if that loss that you think you have to lose by taking various risks is a real loss, or is there something to be gained 
by that risk that you may take. Um, I've taken risk all of my life and it hasn't necessarily been pretty all of the time, but um, I get, I'm still here on the stage with these wonderful <laughs> people, mm -hmm. my colleagues here, and life mm -hmm. goes on even when you take those risks. When you don't take the risk, you risk the chance of nothing happening around you. Mm. That's a big risk, that nothing changes around you when you don't take the risk. And the second point I wanna make um, is that um, when it comes to reducing this disparities in populations who have historically been marginalized um, for decades and who have suffered from poverty um, combined with segregation, combined with um, being uh, depoliticized and all those things that cause oppression, we don't need those communities on substances at all. Um, you know, and so uh, because they're already poor, they're already in circumstances that continue to facilitate the addiction cycle. And so those of us who've been working in disparities research for a long time, don't want our communities on any substances. You know, we want the alcohol stores gone. You know, we want the tobacco shops gone. And we need to leave our communities healthy because they have so many things stacked against them. Mm. And that's just, um, you know, I know people have different opinions about it, but those of us who worked in health disparities research, that is kind of the perspective that we have on that as it comes to addictive products. Thanks for sharing so so honestly and so boldly and also appreciate your encouraging words to the, uh, the upcoming and rising generation as well. Really, really well said. Mitch? Um, I think I'll pick up on Pebble's first point about uh, be bold and take risks. I, I completely agree with that, but um, there's, there's a lesson uh, that needs to be um, top of mind when you do that, which is the, the bolder you're, you're going to be in, in, in the field that, that we're in, given who and what we are up against, the harder it is to bring about profound change. So yes, um, be bold and take the risks, but have patience um, because the more impactful a potential policy or a program is, many times the harder it is to, to see it put into place. So don't give up and have patience. In, in 1994, when I started working on tobacco, um, FDA went to the World Conference on Tobacco and Health for the very first time. And I was one of the, the two FDAers that got on a plane, flew to Paris where there was a smoking section on the plane, and we were sitting in the last row of the non-smoking section, so a lot of good that did <laughs> on an overnight flight with the smoking section right behind us. And, and here we were, we were gonna tear down walls with product regulation in 1994. We're going to the World Conference and someone said, you need to go hear Nigel Gray. Nigel Gray has been, um, who, who, Nigel who's no longer with us, but who a uh, global leader in the field and very prominent member of SRNT for many, many years. They said, you need to go hear Nigel, Nigel Gray talk. And I went to Nigel's talk in 1994, guns a blazing, and, and Nigel said, what we do is so hard that he, he was trying to teach lessons to those of us new to tobacco control at that time. And, and, and his message was um, the yardstick by which we need to measure success or failure because of what we do is so hard is by the decade, 10 year increments before you know whether you have succeeded or failed on, on, on the big stuff, not on the small stuff. And I was sitting there having none of it mm. because we were going to tear down walls, you know, really quickly and, and, and bring about this profound change. But he was right. He was right. And so that's how I would, would, would sync up everything that, that I've had the privilege of working on in, in my career with what Pebbles was saying about being bold and taking risks. That, that's how we get change made. But make sure you have the patience and the intestinal fortitude um, and the dedication and the spirit that I know everybody in this room and everybody listening to this podcast does because the more impactful the change, the harder it is to, to see that change happen. Mm. <coughs> Thanks for sharing, sharing that story as well and that perspective. 
Well, one thing I just want to also add to everything you all have said is just the importance of community as well. Because one thing that jumps out to me is the work that you all do <laughs> as a community, even as you are invested in these other communities as well. So, I mean, that story touches on that. Dr. Fagan, what you've mentioned is also touches on that. And, and also, uh, Kathy, what you've mentioned as well. So, and again, I know I'm pulling in my mental health component, but that's so important for us to be able to be engaged in community, especially in this work where we're wanting to see these changes so that we're able to support one another and not get to a point where we're running a thousand miles an hour and no longer able to continue the work. Um, so just wanted to mention that as well. Again, just an honor to be able to ha have all of you here for this in-person recording. For those um, who are listening, I'd also encourage you to look up these individuals just to learn about the impact and the efforts that they've made and will continue to make. Mitch, I have a feeling that your legacy will continue even when you're no longer officially in the role, and maybe there'll be some way you'll also continue to be contributing, um, as I know many who step into retirement often find themselves doing. I'll Thank just put it that way. So, And thanks to everyone who's been here in person for this live recording. It's been an honor hosting it, and hope that you all really enjoyed the conversation and the way we were able to peel back some of the, the layers, so to speak, as well. Thanks again to all of you for joining. Great. Thank you. Awesome.